Well, hi there. This is a sea turtle. You're probably familiar with sea turtles, but how many species can you name? I'll give you a hint. There are seven. That's one fewer than the number of bear species in the world. Can you name all of those? Well, we have a video on that too, but I will tell you that I'm a zoologist, and until recently, I wouldn't have been able to name all of the sea turtles, despite the fact that I love sea turtles. But of the seven, until recently, I'd only even heard of six of them. I probably couldn't have told you that there are two different Ridley sea turtles, and I definitely couldn't have told you that they might not be one another's closest relatives. And again, there was a whole sea turtle that was entirely new to me. So those of you that were shocked that I didn't know about some groups of whales until I was in graduate school, I got a PhD without knowing all seven sea turtles. If you know them all, you're ahead of where I was until very recently. And if you don't, well, you're about to. And if you love sea turtles, and if you're watching this video, I think you do, then I have something really important that I want to share with you, and that is Planet Wild, who is taking active steps to save sea turtles in the wild. And you can see exactly what it is that they're doing to take action to make the world a better place for wild animals and wild places. Every month, they team up with new partners across the globe to tackle projects that make a huge impact, protecting endangered species, cleaning up oceans, and restoring our forests. And for less than $10 a month, you can be a part of it. Many of these problems are just too big for any one individual to change, but when we team up together, we can change the world. With your support, their on-the-ground dedicated teams do the hard work. And in one of my favorite missions, they're saving sea turtles from poachers with the help of like a Paw Patrol in Cape Verde. You can check that out right here. I'm inviting you to join this incredible journey. The first 200 people will enjoy the first month of Planet Wild membership absolutely free as a personal gift from me. And the best part is that you will be able to make an impact right away and you will see the results of your participation at the latest 30 days after you start, either on their YouTube channel or in their app. And if at any point you don't feel like supporting Planet Wild anymore, you can cancel at any time, no questions asked. Just click the link in the description or scan the QR code to join. Together, let's protect what we love. Thanks to our sponsors at Planet Wild. Now let's talk more about sea turtles. Sea turtles are hidden-necked turtles, which means that they're more closely related to tortoises than they are to side-necked turtles. Which explains why if side-necked turtles and sea turtles are turtles, then so are tortoises. Though their style of locomotion is most similar to that of the fly river turtle. And while that would be a perfectly understandable favorite turtle, I mean, just look at that nose, their closest relatives are the mud and musk turtles, the Central American River Turtle, and my favorite turtles of all, possibly my favorite animals, period, the snapping turtles. Though my favorite is specifically the common snapping turtle. And if you don't know why, uh, you should really watch last Saturday's video. It's a game changer. Seriously. And I'd love your thoughts about it down in the comments. But truth be told, other than the fly river turtle, there is little excuse for confusing a sea turtle with any other sort of life on Earth today. It's a turtle with big flippers that flies through the ocean. If it's in fresh water in or around Australia with a pig nose and big claws on its flippers, that's the only time that you're allowed to think anything else might be a sea turtle. That wouldn't be a sea turtle, but Probably everybody has had that thought the first time that they saw a fly river turtle. You're forgiven. All of the actual sea turtles fall into a single clade, the Chelonioidea. Though in the distant past, there were other lineages of ocean-going turtles as well, including side-necked sea turtles. And some other turtle species will dabble in the saltwater environment. But all of the extant ocean-going flippered turtles are descendants from the same, likely ocean-going, flippered ancestors. That said, uh, it wasn't recently. The split between the two extant sea turtle families, Dermochelidae and Chelonidae, likely occurred while their ancestors still needed, well, to keep an eye out for mosasaurs. Today, the family Dermochelidae, meaning skin turtles, are represented by a single species, the leatherback sea turtle, Dermochelis coriacea. Which is probably why they get both that common name and that scientific name, which both mean leathery skinned turtle. 
If there were more members of the Dermochiliidae alive today, uh, we would probably need more descriptors. But it is the only skin-shelled sea turtle on the planet, so leatherback seemed like an appropriate name. In addition to being the only sea turtle without hard scoots on its shell, and being a living fossil, a term that is often misunderstood, it is also the largest turtle in the world, and the largest reptile outside of the crocodilia. They grow to be about 2.1 meters long and can weigh as much as about 650 kilos. That's more than 1,400 pounds, which makes them uh, one big turtle. Like most of the other sea turtles, but unlike most turtles, there is no clear difference in size based on sex. Dimorphism is most conspicuous with respect to the size of the tail and the position of the cloaca. Males need longer tails with the cloaca located down the tail for reasons that become quite apparent the first time that you see sea turtles attempting to mate. I say that the term living fossil is often misunderstood, and it is. Living fossils are not unchanged examples of organisms that we find in the fossil record. They've been evolving just like everything else. But living fossils are organisms that do not have other close relatives alive today. To find anything else like them, you would need to look to the fossil record. And that is the case for these giant super turtles. And these are super turtles. They are the most hydrodynamic of all sea turtles and have the largest flippers, not only in terms of total size, but also relative to the size of their bodies. The shell is covered in tiny osteoderms instead of scutes and has seven conspicuous ridges running from the leading edge of the shell that all converge at the tip of the trailing edge, though two of these ridges are on the sides of the shell, so you might only notice five if you're looking at one from above. They are the fastest non-avian reptiles in the world, the deepest diving, and thanks to their large body size and high activity rate, they can maintain a body temperature 18 kelvins higher than the surrounding water, allowing it to live not only in tropical and subtropical waters, but in arctic waters as well. They have the broadest distribution of any turtle, because they're super turtles. And despite what you may have read in the worst book I have ever encountered, that super turtle performance is fueled primarily by a diet of jellyfishes and other soft-bodied prey, including manowars. Just to set the record straight, that is the worst book I have ever read. It's so stupid. Anyway, we could easily spend an entire video just talking about how amazing leatherback sea turtles are. But we still need to talk about the other six species. You might not have known just how amazing they are, but I'd be surprised if the leatherback is a new sea turtle for you. To find the ones you might not know, we'll need to dig into the other family, the Chelaniidae. You will never confuse the Chelaniids with the Dermochileids because their shells look, well, much more like those of typical turtles, and are covered with keratinous scutes instead of skin. But you may confuse them with one another. So really quickly, I'm going to run through a quick and dirty guide to sea turtle identification. Then I'll tell you a bit more about them and how they're related to one another. You already know the leatherback sea turtle. Of the six in the Chelaniidae, two have head and limb patterns that look kind of like giraffes. One of them has a more rounded face, typical of a sea turtle. The other has a hooked, pointed beak, like a hawk. The one with a beak like a hawk is a hawksbill sea turtle. The one without is a green sea turtle, which isn't green, but we'll explain its name later. And if the beak isn't a big enough giveaway, you can look at the scales above the eye. If there's a tic-tac-toe board of four scales, it's a hawksbill. Just two scales, it's a green. Those are called prefrontal scales, by the way, since they're in front of the frontal scale. Both have fairly ornate shells. So giraffe coloring with a hawk beak and a four square court is a hawksbill. No hawk beak in a volleyball court is a green. In addition to being giraffe colored, both of these turtles have four what are called lateral or costal scoots on their shells. Not the scoots in the middle, those are called the vertebral scoots which in the hawksbill look like fox faces, and in the green look more like the traditional turtle hexagons. The costal scoots are also not the ones around the edge, those are called the marginal scoots, which are often very spiky in hawksbill turtles. So these scoots here, these are the costal scoots. 
And both hawksbill and green sea turtles have four costal scutes. There's only one more turtle with four costal scutes, and that is the turtle that I'd never heard of before. The flatback sea turtle. And they can be distinguished generally by their lack of giraffe patterning. In fact, they tend to be pretty much patternless overall, just an olive green that fades to lighter on the ventral side. Which just leaves us with the three turtles with more than four costal scoots. Of which, two have five, and one often has six or more. The one often having more than six is the olive ridley sea turtle. Though loggerheads may occasionally have six as well. But many of the scoots on olive ridleys will look more like rectangles than the pentagons and hexagons more typical of sea turtles. And the sides of their heads tend to be pretty white. So really, the two that you might confuse based on their costal scoots would be just the loggerheads and the Kemp's Ridley sea turtles. Both of them generally have five. But Kemp's Ridley sea turtles are about as wide as they are long. They're like circle turtles. Loggerheads are more oval or teardrop shaped like most other sea turtles. With the giant noggins. So that's all of them. But I think we can go a little deeper than that. Hey guys, I literally just got back from the championship of the Snake Discovery Enclosure build off. And I have to tell you, it was quite an experience, but Leisha and I created something that I am extremely, extremely proud of. And so if you haven't seen it yet, go over to Snake Discovery, watch the video, check out all the amazing enclosures because everybody did a fantastic job. And if you like what we created, please consider voting for our creation. It was something I've never, I've never seen anything like it before. I've never done anything like it before. We made an incredible pirate of the Caribbean themed enclosure for Caribbean lizards, the curly tailed lizards, which are so underrated and so amazing and we will be covering them soon. But the details that we were able to put into this, the forced perspective, the longer you look at it, the more you might realize what an insane build it is. I've never, for one thing, I've never seen a build where you are inside of the cave looking out. I've never seen a build where it tries so hard to create perspective so that things in the distance look genuinely far away, like, I don't know, a pirate ship. Uh, I've never seen, I've never seen anybody attach pieces of universal rock to the ceiling of an enclosure to give that feeling of being inside of the cave. There were just, there were so many things I'd never seen before, so many things I'd never done before, and genuinely, with 45 minutes left, it looked like it was going to be a total disaster, but it wasn't. So please go over there and see what we've done. Also see the amazing enclosures that the other creators made because really, Everybody brought their A-game. It was so much fun. I had a blast. And, and more than anything, I'm just, I'm proud of what Leisha and I created together. I'm proud of what all of the other creators did and just the friendships and the camaraderie that we created. It was a blast and I, I think you'll like it. We'll have links to that video and to the voting down in the description. So anyway, go check out that video. Give us a vote if, if you like it and uh, now back to the video. The six species in the Kalaniidae are all more closely related to one another than they are to the leatherback sea turtles or any other living things. But the exact relationships between these six are a bit controversial. I'll start here. We are pretty confident that the two Ridley turtles and the loggerhead are one another's closest relatives, all together forming the subfamily Caretinae. The debate is just about which two are the most closely related. Historically, uh, and as evidenced by their shared genus name and common name, the two Ridley turtles were considered to be one another's closest relatives. However, recent phylogenetic analysis has suggested that the olive Ridley, you know, the one with the rectangle scoots, well, it may be more closely related to the loggerhead than it is to the Kemp's Ridley. Which, if true, would mean that either the loggerhead would need to be added to the Ridley genus, Lepidocheles, or that one of the two Ridley sea turtles would need to be assigned to a different genus. You can't have two turtles in the same genus when one of them is more closely related to another genus. That's not how monophyly works. 
So let's talk about the three of them and see which relationship we think makes the most sense. Let's start with the Kemp's Ridley, the rarest sea turtle in the world. As adults, they are found almost exclusively around the Gulf of Mexico, though they do occasionally end up in other parts of the Atlantic. But almost all of the Kemp's Ridleys found out of the Gulf of Mexico are juveniles and subadults. They feed mostly on crunchy marine animals like crustaceans, mollusks, and sea urchins, but also fish, cnidarians, and macroalgae. Adults feed mostly at the ocean's bottom, but juveniles tend to feed at the surface, which probably explains to some degree why juveniles get away from the shallows more often than do adults. Even as adults, Kemp's Ridleys are small, the smallest of all sea turtles, at no more than 75 centimeters carapace length and 50 kilos. A big turtle, but for a sea turtle, you know, the tiniest. They're also weird because, as previously mentioned, they're almost round, like circular. And not only do they tend to nest in only one place, Rancho Nuevo Beach in Mexico, but they are the only species of sea turtle that generally nests during the day, which puts that beach on my bucket list of places to visit. And the Kemp's Ridley may be the closest relative to this turtle, the Olive Ridley which is the second smallest, behind only the rarest turtle in the world, the Kemp's Ridley, but it is the most abundant of all sea turtles. They're found primarily in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, but occur in most tropical and subtropical waters worldwide, though they do tend to stay closer to land because they feed on a very similar diet to the Kemp's Ridleys. They also nest similarly to Kemp's Ridleys. Not that they do it during the day, but that they often do it in large numbers, swamping potential predators. A strategy called an arribada, which is probably more necessary for smaller turtles like these. They may be the second smallest on average, but they really are about the same size as Kemp's Ridley's. Though in all of Ridley's, females are larger on average than males, which is pretty unusual for a sea turtle, though not that unusual for a turtle generally. And again, thanks to their generally more than five, more rectangular costal scoots, you are unlikely to confuse them with anything else. But, as we already mentioned, their closest relatives may not actually be the turtles with which they share names. It might be these. The loggerhead sea turtles. Which, at a glance, don't seem like they would be in the middle of this group of tiny sea turtles. These are the largest members of the Kalenia Day, and the second largest of all extant sea turtles. They grow to be over 2 meters long, and can weigh nearly 550 kilos. In fact, they are the second largest turtles, period, and are the largest hard-shelled turtles on planet Earth. And given that there is no evidence of hard-shelled turtles having colonized other worlds, that probably makes them the largest hard-shelled turtles in existence. And. Similarly to their comparatively tiny cousins, they feed primarily on benthic invertebrates, which they munch with their not only large, but disproportionately large jaws and jaw muscles on their beefy heads. These powerful jaws allow them to eat the widest range of foods of any sea turtle, probably any turtle, period. Though they don't get into the Arctic Circle like leatherbacks, they have a huge distribution through the warmer regions of the Earth, and have the largest nesting range of any turtle. And this will upset those of you that love the biological species concept, but they have been demonstrated to hybridize with Kemp's Ridley turtles, even producing viable offspring that have had their own offspring. And that isn't even the turtle that we suspect to be their closest relative. But it gets worse because we have similar evidence regarding hybrids with more distantly related turtles, like hawksbill and green sea turtles. Which either means that we probably have uh, maybe just two total species of sea turtles, or the biological species concept, intuitive as it is, isn't the best way to determine a species. And if you'd like for me to make a video about species concepts in the future, write, uh, what's a species down in the comments. We're pretty confident that all of the Kalaniid turtles are more closely related to one another than they are to the leatherback. And that the three species in the Caretinae are one another's closest relatives, though which two are closest is up for debate. But these last three are particularly tricky. Some phylogenies don't make a call about where they go, other than inside of the Kalaniidae, but outside of the Caretinae. But those that do make a call generally seem to conclude that the hawksbill is more closely related to the Caretinae than it is to the other two members of the Kalaniidae. I gotta ask you. Is this the most beautiful sea turtle? 
It certainly has to be a contender. And that is just the lights on. With the lights off, they're definitely the winner. That's right, they're biofluorescent. The only known biofluorescent reptiles. An attribute that they may obtain from their diet, which includes many biofluorescent prey. But whatever you think of its aesthetic, its beak really sets it apart from the rest. It really is a very hawk-like beak. So what do they use it for? Well, mostly for eating sponges. Though also cnidarians and some macroalgae and other animals such as mollusks, fish, and crustaceans. But mostly specific types of sponges. And many of their foods are highly toxic. And not only are they resistant to those toxins, but they can sequester them in their own tissues and become toxic themselves. So this is a potentially biofluorescent and poisonous turtle. If you're looking for a second favorite turtle, this has got to be a contender for that too. And if you've been paying attention, you already know that the hawksbills have to be smaller than the leatherbacks or loggerheads, but larger than the two Ridley turtles. And you're correct! Well done paying attention. They can get to be a touch over a meter long and can weigh as much as 127 kilos. They're found globally in tropical and subtropical waters, mostly on tropical reefs with lots of sponges. So that might be my favorite sea turtle. But there are two more. And the phylogenies that make any claims about their relationships to one another, hawksbill sea turtles and the three members of the Caretinae, tend to place them here as being most closely related to one another and sister to all of the rest of the Kelaniidae. So the green sea turtle, possibly the sea turtle I knew the best, and the flatback sea turtle, the turtle I just discovered, are one another's closest relatives. So how is it that I knew one so well and the other I never heard of? I suspect that a lot of it has to do with where they live. Green sea turtles are found pretty much everywhere except for the polar regions. Flatback sea turtles are not. Not at all. But we'll get to them in a second. Green sea turtles are also contenders for being the largest of all hard-shelled sea turtles. I have seen many sources that claim that they are. But with the largest on record being just a touch over one and a half meters long and weighing 395 kilos, I see no evidence that they get larger than loggerheads. And their average size is also slightly smaller than loggerheads. So I feel pretty comfortable saying that they are the second largest hard-shelled sea turtles. But that wouldn't even have them as the third largest turtle. Some tortoises are larger than they are, as well as the two larger sea turtles. But they are the largest herbivorous sea turtles. Now they aren't herbivorous during their entire lifespan. As juveniles, they eat a lot of the same things as most of the other turtles that we've discussed. But as adults, they eat nearly entirely photosynthetic organisms. So much so that their fat even turns green, which is where they get their name. They really aren't green, but their fat is. On the outside, they do look the most like hawksbill turtles, especially if you count the coastal scoots. But again, their short beak and more normal non-overlapping scoots will allow you to tell them apart from their bioluminescent, poisonous, sawback, foursquare loving cousins. But the cousins I want most to discuss are the ones that I only recently discovered. The closest relatives of the green sea turtles. The flatback sea turtles. Here is a word that I haven't used today. Endemic. Five of the six turtles that we have discussed so far are pretty much just endemic to Earth. They go basically everywhere warm with the word ocean in it. Even the little Kemp's Ridley does a little bit of world traveling in its youth. But not these. They said, Crikey, there's nowhere I'd rather be than down under. So they live exclusively in the waters surrounding western, northern, and eastern Australia. That means they get up around Papua New Guinea and that's where they call it a range. They don't even go to southern Australia. They have no idea that Tasmania is a thing. And New Zealand? <laughs> Forget about it. Which means that I have only been in their native range for one day in my entire life. But I hope to change that soon. However, I bet that I'm not the only person here who didn't know about these little homebody turtles. And little may be a stretch. They can get over 350 kilos, with females being larger than males. But in general, they look like a patternless green sea turtle. Apparently their shell is very thin compared to other sea turtles and is prone to cracking. 
which is a diagnostic feature that I hope you never discover. But despite looking like a thin-shelled, patternless green sea turtle, they eat a diet much more similar to that of most of the other sea turtles. But I do think I can see how they escaped my radar for so long. So what group should we cover next? As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. Males need longer tails with the cloaca located down the tail for reasons that become quite apparent the first time that you see sea turtles attempting to mate. Go on. Well... <laughs> The shell introduces certain logistical problems when it comes to mating, uh, as you can't get that close to your partner necessarily. So it's okay. So it's it's located closer to the end of the, the tail. end of the tail. They should just do this. Just go go plastron to plastron. <laughs> that's that's the name of the position. Mm. <laughs> Double plastron. Double yep. plastron. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so it's a longer tail, and the, and it's located not not further up to the base, but further to the the tip of the tail. Yeah, I'll give you a good reason why they probably don't go P to P. And and it, it, it probably would work, but it doesn't work so well for land turtles. Which one was the one that you didn't know about? Flat flat back sea turtle. How, why is it that you think it escaped you? Because they're only found in a tiny, tiny little range. All of the other sea turtles are in North America. Really? Yeah. And they are only around the northern portion of, the northern, eastern, and western portion of Australia. So, uh, put yourselves in the shoes of all the Australians that are going to see this video. They're like, how'd you not know about a flat ace? Ha, 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 ha.